vector works. Um, so remember, I'll show this again, that when you see this, a matrix by a vector means exactly this. So it means first beta by the multiplied by the first column, second beta by the second column, all the way until the last beta multiplied by the last column. So it goes column wise. And then you add all of them together. OK, so we've done this. OK, oop. Good, OK, two questions. Um, you should already know the answers to these relatively easily. This is just to recap things um, that we already talked about. So um, a voxel's bold signal at rest is 100. That's the baseline. When the participant is reading sentences, the signal increases to 120. When they're reading non-words, the signal increases to 110. When approximating the bold signal using our three predictors, what should the beta weights be for sentences um, and for non-words? So think about it. What do you think? C, right. Um, the errors that some people do is they think it's 120 and 110, but remember that the beta doesn't give you the absolute intensity of the signal. It tells you by how much the signal increases from baseline. So it increases by 20 units and by 10 units from the baseline. Cool? OK. Another question. At the beginning of the experiment, when the participant is not reading anything, the predictors that contribute to the approximation are, and you need to choose, and then 12 seconds after the participants have started reading, uh, it should be singular, has started reading non-words, the predictors that contribute to the approximation are, and there's another thing. And by contribute, I mean contribute non-trivially. Obviously, all predictors contribute all the time, but sometimes they contribute zero, which is a trivial contribution. So here by contribute, I mean something that's not zero. What's the answer? D. Good. So during baseline, the only predictor that is not at zero is the, is the baseline predictor or the constant predictor. And then when during non-words, you don't have sentences, so the sentence predictor is at zero. But you get a contribution both from the baseline and from the non-words, because you have whatever baseline activity you have plus the increase that the beta for non-words tells you about. OK. Um, so this is the analysis we've talked about. This is the way that actually works for analyzing functional MRI data. Um, and up until now, you've been doing it with trial and error, trying to find the good betas. But of course, we don't sit and do that for every voxel. We use a model called the general linear model that finds the betas for us. OK. Um, so the general linear model uses this formula that you've already seen. The bold signal, and you can think of the bold signal as a column vector. So the signal from von voxel is modeled as some design matrix. So these are here we have each column is a different predictor, times the beta weights plus some error. This multiplication is actually the linear combination of our predictors and their weights. So these are explained variations in the signal, ex variations in the signal that we can explain based on our paradigm or our experiment. And then the errors are unexplained things that we could not predict, or task-related activity changes plus noise. Um, just to remind you, you already know this because you've answered this question before. We know the bold signal. That's something we have and we give to the GLM because we collect this from the brain. We know the design matrix. We build it based on our experiment. So these are the two things we give the GLM. And then what we want to find, what the GLM gives back to us, is the vector of beta weight, so a beta weight for each predictor. Um, and these are beta weights that give the best approximation. How we find it, or how the GLM finds it, the best approximation is the approximation that minimizes the errors. And specifically, we minimize the sum of squared errors. So if you've computed, you've computed an error for each time point, but these are many, many errors. And we want one measure that takes into account all of these errors. And the way we do this is we square each error 
So if we have an error of 4, we turn it to 16. If we have an error of minus 2, we turn it to 4. We square all of them, and then we sum them to get one number. So it's sum of squares. Um, just so you know, there are two reasons why we square all the errors instead of adding them together. First of all, when we square them, all of them turn to positive. So positive and negative errors don't cancel each other out anymore. It doesn't, ma it doesn't make sense for errors, positive errors and negative errors to cancel each other, right? W the more errors we have, we want the measure of error to be higher. So we turn them all to positive. And the second thing is that when you square things, uh, when you square number, the bigger the number, the, uh, the more, I don't know, the, the more intensive the effect of the squaring is, right? So 2 turns to 4, but 5 turns to 25. And what that does is that it gives a huge weight to the large errors. And it gives a smaller weight to the smaller errors. And that means that what the GLM wants to do is mainly to minimize the very, very large errors, because we give them a lot of weight. The small errors we never can approximate perfectly. That's noise that we can't really do much about. So the GLM cares mostly about minimizing the really big errors. Does that make sense? Cool. OK. Um, in practice, the GLM uses a formula. It's a one-line formula that guarantees to find the beta weight. So there is a formula that says beta equals something else that you do with the rest of these numbers that you don't have to know how to do, because MATLAB can do. Um, and it gives you the beta weights. OK, in MATLAB, you have a very nice function that's called regress, because this is uh, another uh, w name for the general linear model is multiple regression. Um, so to find the beta weights, you call a function regress with the bold signal in a column, and then the matrix of predictors. Um, again, each predictor in a column and all together in one matrix. And that gives you the vector of beta weights. That's it. Um, then the question is what to do when you get these betas. So you want to ask, in our case, whether the beta for sentences is bigger than the beta for non-words. Um, okay. Now the comparison has to take into account the errors, like we've seen before at the very beginning that we talked about comparing averages. And we saw that we need to take into account noise. It's the same principle here. We can't just compare two betas. We need to take into account how good our, approxi our approximation is. So we take the noise or the errors into account. So if we have big errors, that means our approximation to begin with is very, very bad. Right? It's very poor. It doesn't actually approximate the signal. That means that any difference between the betas is probably due to chance, because we're not really capturing anything about the signal anyway. We have so many errors. If we have small errors, that means our approximation of the signal is good. We're actually capturing something about the signal with our predictors. And then we're more likely to believe that the difference between the betas is meaningful. The betas mean something. If we don't approximate the signal and we have big errors, the betas don't mean anything. OK. Um, so a little thing about predictors. Any predictor that can help us approximate the signal will decrease the sum of squared errors, right? The better our approximation is, the less errors we have. So we actually include more predictors in our design matrix, um, in this matrix of columns. First of all, we add six predictors for head motion. So while the subject is in the scanner, we have a way of estimating how much their head moves. It's very easy. It's not very easy, but intuitively it's easy. You look at two consecutive volumes of the brain and you just see how their brain moved between one picture and the next. And the reason we have six is that you have three ways of translating your head. So you can move your head um, along this axis or along this axis or along that axis. And you have three rotations. Um, so the way to remember them is yes, uh, no, and maybe so. So these are the sh three directions in which you can rotate your head. Um, and each of these is a vector that tells you how much um, the participant moved its head between each two consecutive time points. It's really hard to see, but there are differences in color here. Um, for example, this is a little wider than this. Um, so here the subject moved their head in one direction, and this is negative. They moved their head in the other direction. It's hard to see here at all, but here there is a line of switch between black and white. So this is a point where the subject stopped moving in one direction and started moving in the other direction. Um, so we include these because motion affects our signal a lot. And we also have two time derivatives. Time derivatives are basically taking our interesting predictors and only no 
uh, and only including the differences between consecutive points. So all of this is kind of the same, but here there's a difference, so we put a small line here. And all of this is the same, but here there's a difference again, so we put a small, um, it's a black line here that you can't see. And here there's a white line, here there's a black line. What these enable us to do is to shift a little bit the, our approximation a little further in time or a little back in time. So if I add this vector here to this vector here, the result is basically taking this vector and just shifting it one time point back or one time point forward. Um, and that is because not all participants have the same hemodynamic response function. Sometimes the signal takes five seconds to arrive, sometimes six, sometimes seven, sometimes four. And even within the brain, different voxels don't have the same hemodynamic response function. So these help us to, if we need to adjust our predictors a little bit, they enable us to shift our approximations. Um, so now we have 11 betas, because we have 11 regressors or predictors, not just three. Um, all of the predictors that are not these two, or the baseline, we call them predictors of no interest. We don't really care about these betas. We only include them to make our approximation better. OK? Cool. We don't really care about these betas. Um, demonstration with MATLAB to show you how adding more predictors can affect your results. Where is that? OK. Ah, what happened? Undefined variable. Wonderful. Um, oh, I see. Let's run this again. OK, now it's working. Um, let me move it to your place so you can see it. Why is this so big? Um, OK, so. Um, this seems wrong. Oh, it is wrong. I know it's wrong. Uh, sorry about this. Um, I want 11, 1, 3, 2. Okay. Now it should work. Last minute changes. Um, OK, so I'm taking, now these are real voxels from the brain, and I'm showing you um, only three predict uh, the, the approximation using only three predictors that we've used before versus 11 predictors. So you can see that the approximation is a little more wobbly um, when I have 11 predictors. I can predict a little bit the tiny changes due to motion. Um, but in th for this voxel, you see that it doesn't make much of a difference. The approximations look pretty much the same. Here's another example. Um, you can see that in certain places, I do get the peaks that I don't get here. So this here predicts just one flat line, but here I do get these like three peaks. Um, so it gets a little better, maybe. Here's a voxel where you can see that everything is noise. Because when I have my actual three predictors, I don't predict much. It's not really good. Um, or it's not just noise, but it's a lot of noise. Um, and you can see that when I add 11 predictors, my approximation gets really, really good which means that adding all this, these motion parameters actually allows me to predict the signal very well. Um, another example, you can see that it gets a little better. Um, and here's, this is like the real noise. This is a voxel that is really nothing. Um, and then adding it doesn't ma really make it any better. I just can't predict what is happening in that voxel. Another example, okay, that's it. Um, so this was just so you can see how adding more predictors affects my results. And now let's go back to this. OK, so why, why should we stop there? Why not add a gazillion regressors or predictors? Because um, you can think, you know, the, more, the better I approximate my signals, the less errors I get. The less errors I get, the better, because I will believe my dif the, a difference between my two betas, the de beta for sentences and beta for non-words. The reason is that statistics makes us pay a price for any additional regressor we add. Um, so intuitively, you can think that if you have 10,000 regressors, 
it's really easy to get an approximation of any signal even just by chance, right? Because you have so many predictors, some of them are going to help you to predict your signal. And then the difference between the beta for sentences and the beta for non-words is just random. But if you can get a, a good approximation of a brain signal with only 10 predictors or 11 predictors, that's impressive, right? That's not trivial, that's not trivial at all. Um, and the statistics is going to help you if you use fewer regressors, and it's going to uh, be more willing to believe a given difference between your two betas. Put another way, imagine that I get a beta of 4 uh, for sentences and then a beta of 2 for non-words. So the difference between the two betas is 2. If I used many, many, many predictors, statistics is going to tell me a difference is of 2 is not enough. I don't really believe that. But if I use few predictors, then statistics are going to tell me a difference of 2 is pretty big, it's pretty impressive, I believe you. Um, therefore, we add some predictors to help us, ones that make sense, but we stop there. We usually don't add uh, many predictors beyond this. Okay. Um, now, oh, that's great. Um, so now you have three, th no, yeah, three exercises. Um, one exercise is when you do the GLM yourself. So here you need to use the uh, command regress. And regress, I remind you, it gets two arguments. The first argument is this, the bold signal. The second argument is the matrix of predictors. Then you have an exercise about computing the SSE, the sum of squared errors. And then you will run a GLM with 11 predictors and see how it affects the results compared to only three predictors. So these are exercises 12 to 14. And after that, I have one more thing to show you, and then we're done.